What's up, everyone? How you doing? I'm glad I could be here to host your hangover. Um, I want to say I'm extremely humbled to be in front of so many of you. You guys have created experiences that have made me so happy as a gamer. So on behalf of all gamers out there and myself, thank you for what you guys have done. I also want to give a shout out to my team. It's always a little awkward at Blizzard because everything we do is a team effort. So whenever we put one of us forward, I like to remind everybody that everything we do at Blizzard is a team effort. And I think a lot of you guys who work on team-based games understand how important the team is. So to my team, I'm honored to be speaking on your behalf. Hopefully I don't screw it up. So world building is the theme of this year's DICE uh, Summit. And it's one of my favorite things about video games. It's, it's probably the area that I feel most comfortable in. So I was very excited to be uh, asked to talk about world building as it relates to Overwatch. So what I want to do is start with a concept uh, from one of the movies that we made called Recall. And in this movie, it features a doctor named Harold Winston who has a baby gorilla on the moon. And at one point, the, the baby gorilla had never seen anything beyond just boring moonscape his whole life. And he has this moment where he shows baby Winston what planet Earth looks like. And he says, never accept the world as it appears to be, but dare to see it for what it could be. And I feel like this, more than anything else, really sums up the world building philosophy on Overwatch. And I'm going to come back to this later on. So I just wanted to share this with you and remind you of it. So the story actually begins with the project before Overwatch, which was a, a project called Titan. So Titan was to be a successor MMO to World of Warcraft. It's something that we began development on in 2007. And for various reasons, we ran into a lot of trouble on the project. Um, and ultimately, in May of 2013, we had to put an end to the, to the project, which was very rough because at that time, the team had grown to be about 140 developers, and we were really emotionally invested in what we were trying to do with the game. So as May of 2013 rolled around, we got the team in the room, 140 people. 80 of us were told that we would be permanently relocated to other teams within Blizzard. We'd go on to work on Diablo, Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, Heroes of the Storm, StarCraft II etc. About another 20 of the developers would be long-term loans on those projects. And what long-term to us means is anywhere from six months to two years. So you weren't going to come back to the, to, to the Titan team anytime soon. What was left was a group of about 40 developers who were given the task of come up with a new idea for a Blizzard game in six weeks. And if we came up with a concept that was compelling enough, we would move forward and we would make that one of our next projects. If we didn't come up with something that was super compelling, we too would be redistributed to the other teams at Blizzard. Needless to say, it was a very daunting, almost devastating sort of mindset that the team was in because we were unsure of what our future was going to be. And it was during this time that Overwatch was born. Now, I've been at Blizzard for almost 15 years, and I always thought in the early years of working at Blizzard that one of the dreams that I had as a Blizzard developer was having the opportunity to come up with a new Blizzard game. It seemed like it would be the most fun, uh, sort of inspiring activity. But fast forward to May of 2013, we were going through that process in a period of sort of despair. There wasn't a lot of hope on the team. We were very nervous about what our future was. So we started off with an ideation process. And we came up, we, we decided to sort of split our six weeks up into these two week blocks. So we spent two weeks on an MMO that was in the uh, another Blizzard universe that we haven't made an MMO in. There's a lot of choices for you to figure out which it was. Um, and then we also spent another two weeks on a brand new uh, MMO that took place in a completely uh, new intellectual property. And during this time, almost on the side, we started cooking up this idea that became Overwatch. And where the idea came from was we had an amazing artist by the name of Arnold Sang who was drawing these fantastic character designs. He had done many of them back on Project Titan. 
and we were sort of looking at his work, and then at the same time, as we were doing these MMO uh, pitch ideas, we had a class designer by the name of Jeff Goodman, who had also been an encounter designer, did all the big raid bosses on World of Warcraft, and he had all these amazing class designs, and we started to think about, you know, well, what if we took Arnold and Jeff, you know, strengths and put them together, and that really led to the project that was to become Overwatch. So this was an early rendition that Arnold did of what the Overwatch lineup might be, and some of these characters were actually taken from the project before, which was Project Titan. Um, and there was a lot of inspiration that we had taken from Titan. In particular, Titan was a game that wanted to take place on planet Earth, and we had this uh, sort of concept of a future worth fighting for that was coined on Titan, but we were never able to figure it out and make it work. Um, fast forward to Overwatch, and we were starting to figure it out more. We had a really talented artist by the name of Ben Zhang, who, this was in, um, I think, June of 2013, where he created this concept picture. We, we started talking about how we wanted Overwatch to play and how we wanted Overwatch to feel, and Ben made this image that I think really holds up today for those of you who have seen Overwatch and knows what the game looks like. This was almost like a guiding light image for us about the game that we wanted to create. And I need to say this for our subreddit so it doesn't implode. No, the, the hero in the center is not the hero who you think, think it is. Thank you for putting up with that. Um, so as you guys know, Blizzard has um, been fortunate enough to work in some very exciting IP spaces. And world building is something that we really enjoy doing. It's one of our favorite things. Um, we've been fortunate enough to explore high fantasy in the Warcraft universe. We've been lucky enough to go to high science fiction in StarCraft, and then also gothic fantasy in Diablo. And I think any Blizzard developer feels very comfortable in these spaces. If you were go to go up to a Blizzard developer and say, hey, we need an idea for a Diablo dungeon, or we need an idea for a StarCraft planet or a Warcraft zone, this is our natural comfort space. But with Overwatch, like with Project Titan, we wanted to push ourselves into a new frontier that we hadn't explored. And at Blizzard, that challenging frontier happened to be planet Earth. Um, and it was really daunting to us. For a while on Titan, we really struggled. Our developers would often ask the question, uh, what's cool about planet Earth? We love these fantasy universes that we explore. We love these science fiction universes that we explore. But what is so interesting about planet Earth to us that we can make a Blizzard game that takes place there. So our first step was to sort of study, you know, how were other games approaching planet Earth? Or what was really going on in, in gaming around planet Earth? And we found, I mean, there's a lot going on. Um, and when you put things like uh, sports games to the side uh, for a second and look at the universe building that was happening there, there was some incredible stuff. So, you know, starting off, um, an obvious one is post-apocalyptic, and some of the most beautiful games of our era uh, were post-apocalyptic. I look at a game like Last of Us, which I think we can all agree on is, is pretty much a masterpiece or a Fallout 4. Um, so some incredible work being done in this space, and it didn't feel like there was a lot of breathing room for us to make a new statement. It felt like a very daunting place for us to go. Um, equally daunting to us, because some incredible games were being built in the space, was realism. Um, I think I've lost more hours of my life to the Battlefield and Call of Duty series than anyone. I've frequently told the story about how World of Warcraft production literally shut down for a week when the Battlefield 1942 Wake Island demo came out. I'm not sure how many of you remember that, but we just stopped work and uh, pretty much bombed each other for a week. And, um, we actually, it was one of those moments where you get the team talking to you, like, okay, that's enough Battlefield, guys. It's time to get back to making World of Warcraft. So um, we decided, you know, like with Titan, we wanted to go back. We wanted to finish the challenge and um, finish with this, wor this future wor worth fighting for. Um, we weren't seeing a lot of games exploring the space of what is near future Earth, but in a sort of positive, hopeful way. And this is the place where we wanted to be and we wanted to explore. 
So as we embarked on this journey to, to world build what was to become the Overwatch version of Earth, we actually started with World of Warcraft and we looked back on some of our basic tenets of world building from World of Warcraft. And the pictures that I've uh, chosen to show behind me are very deliberate. It's the human starting area of World of Warcraft, for those of you not familiar with it. And it, it encompasses Elwyn Forest, Red Ridge, Duskwood, and Westfall. And these areas are unique because they each have their own special story, but the variation is what was important to us. Um, they very deliberately, our art director on Overwatch, who happened to be the art director on original World of Warcraft at the time, always talks about color theory of location. And these areas in WoW are very deliberately green, red, yellow, and blue. Um, it has an immediate emotional impact on players. Uh, for those of you who have played World of Warcraft, I always use the example of that moment when you wander from Elwyn Forest and you cross the river into Duskwood, you immediately have an emotional change that happens in you. You know something different is happening. And we really want to take this concept of variation and bring it into this new world we were building for Overwatch. The other lesson that we learned from World of Warcraft is what I like to refer to as the Burning Crusade lesson. So Burning Crusade introduced a new planet to World of Warcraft, one called Outland. It was very familiar to players of Warcraft 2. They had seen it before. Um, and, and it was familiar to Warcraft 3 players. But Burning Crusade was very interesting to us from a developer standpoint. And I think a lot of game developers and a lot of you in this room, we have a hyper-sensitive geek radar. And what I mean by that is, we are extremely attracted to things that are different and sort of challenging, more so, I think, than your average person. So we have the, the concept art that I'm showing behind is for zones like Hellfire Peninsula, Netherstorm, Shadow Moon Valley, and Blades Edge Mountains. And immediately, as game developers, we responded to these areas. Like, these are the coolest places ever. I can't wait to build them. I can't wait to go there as a player. Well, what we found out over time is that environments like this can actually be very oppressive and fatiguing to players. And in a game where you hope that players spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours, you kind of need a visual and a tonal break from the oppressiveness every so often. So in Burning Crusade, we started to see players hanging out more and more in Nagrand, or going to Terracar Forest, or even back to starting areas like Stormwind in the old world because they found places like Netherstorm and Shadow Moon Valley so utterly oppressive. So this was a lesson we immediately thought of with Overwatch. Our goal was to make the game very approachable. We wanted it to feel as inclusive as possible. We wanted as many gamers in the world to feel like Overwatch was a place that they were welcome. So when it came to world building in Overwatch, we started to ask the question, okay, we're making this game that takes place on planet Earth. Where would you want to spend time on planet Earth? What's cool and fun? So what are some vacation spots? So Santorini, Greece, uh, which is the place on the left, um, some place I've always wanted to go in my life, uh, literally dreamed as, as a fantasy for me, like, wow, it'd be so great to go there. It looks so beautiful. I've seen so many pictures. And on the right is our map called Ilios, which is our homage to Santorini, Greece. So we started really with this concept of, um, you know, visit places that people have always wanted to go to uh, and might not ever have the opportunity to get to in their lifetime. If they're going to spend hundreds, and, hundreds or thousands of hours there, make it somewhere you want to be, not somewhere you're uh, uh, oppressed by. We also wanted to be um, hopeful. I have talked about how a bright, hopeful uh, vision of, of planet Earth was what we were sort of after. Um, so my slide has not advanced correctly, so we're having a technical moment here. Um, so Iraq was another place we wanted to go to. Um, now, if you look at how Iraq has been portrayed in video games for the past 10 years, I would describe it as usually war-torn, a place of conflict, uh, a place of little hope. But Overwatch takes place 60 years in the future, 
and we were asking ourselves on the Overwatch team, could we imagine a better future for Iraq? Is it really necessary to show dusty streets or bombed out buildings anymore? Haven't we seen enough of that, um, not only in video games, but in the world? So can we please imagine a better future for Iraq? So the Overwatch vision of Iraq is that a, one of the most techni technologically advanced cities in the world exists in Iraq, and it was built by a, a group of scientists and researchers hoping to make an even better future for people on planet Earth. So that's, that was our vision of it. Um, and where all of this is going is sort of that old cliche that fantasy is greater than reality. Um, and there's nothing new here. It's, it's all about uh, tapping into the imagination of your players. And your players can imagine things far greater than, than we can build them. Um, and we really wanted to, to run with this, this kind of idea that fantasy is greater than reality. Um, and I have a couple stories that, that I think sum this up better than, than any others. So one is the story of Hollywood, which is one of the locations in Overwatch. Now, I grew up in Southern California. While I was in college, I interned for four years at Universal Pictures. And when I was a teenager, I used to hang out on Melrose Boulevard, going into the vinyl record stores and trying to buy imports. God, I'm fucking agent. I just realized. <laughs> so records were this thing. No, I'm just kidding. But um, so I spent a lot of time in Hollywood growing up. And when it came time to make a map in Overwatch that took place in the US, uh, myself and Chris Metzen, who's the creative director, really wanted to do something in Hollywood. We thought it was one of those strong fantasies of you know, people who weren't from California or who had never been there probably would like to spend some time in Hollywood. Um, and we're very fortunate at Blizzard to have an amazingly talented environmental art team. Um, but our environmental art team is uh, comprised of a lot of foreign folks. So we have um, people from Belgium, Sweden, Portugal, Brazil, sort of the list goes on, and none of them are from Southern California. So they start building this Hollywood map, and it's looking amazing. Like, they build the streets of Hollywood, and we're just blown away at like what their vision was for that map. But when it came to work on the backlot portion of the map, um, they didn't really know what a Hollywood backlot was. So we sent them up on a day trip to one of the studios to check out the backlot, get an idea of what sound stages look like, that sort of thing. Um, and it was fantastic. They got a ton of great reference. But there was this unfortunate moment where they drove through Hollywood on the way home. And they get back to the studio. And they start redoing the streets of Hollywood. And they're, and they're saying just they did this totally different concept. And they're like, we got it all wrong. It doesn't look anything like what we were building. And we were panicked because, it, it, honestly, it looked kind of shitty. You know, the, the new version, it looked like Hollywood. <laughs> And we went back to them and we said, like, no, I, I would rather have the Hollywood as it appears in the mind of the guy from Belgium or Sweden than the Hollywood that exists in the, in the, in the real world. We're not after realism. You know, for those of you who know, we have a map that takes place in London. And we, we have an EMP garage under Big Ben, which makes no sense whatsoever. So it's not about realism. It's about that fantasy. Um, similar story with the Mexican map that we built, which is called Dorado. So we knew for a lot of reasons Dorado was an important story location in Overwatch. We had a hero coming up that was from Mexico. We had a movie that we were making called Hero that takes place in Mexico. And there was a lot of storytelling we wanted to do in this area. So myself and the assistant uh, game director, Aaron Keller, were looking at locations in Mexico uh, to, to build. And we started with Mexico City, but it just didn't work for us. Mexico City is a very contemporary, urban, sort of modern, what you expect it to be type of city. And the map we needed to build had to be coastal for gameplay reasons. We needed the edge of the map to be um, open. So we wanted a coastal town. It had to be hilly. And we wanted there to be a lot of color in the map. We really wanted there to be color, but we were kind of ignorant about you know, the area besides like, you know, Mexico City, we live in Southern California, so we're familiar with, you know, Tijuana and Ensenada, but none of them were, were really hitting what we wanted. So uh, being the utmost top researchers in the industry, we went to uh, Google Images, <laughs> and we typed in 
This is literally like, you can type this in right now on your phone if you want. Colorful Mexican town is what we typed in. And we, were, we weren't even looking at the picture. We were just looking at the thumbnail pictures. And we're like, this is it. This is perfect. It's so awesome. This is exactly the, the version of Mexico that we, we wanted to, to build. And like I said, we hadn't even blown up the picture. But the one that we talked about the most that really fit the, the gray box block out of the map that we had was this one right here, um, which was just gorgeous, this like coastal seaside town. After we had completed the map, I think it was about two months after, um, someone came up to us and said, um, <laughs> why are you calling, <laughs> why did you use Manarola, Italy as your reference for your Mexico map? Um, and I think this kind of is very exemplary of the idea that Overwatch is not about the reality of what the planet is. Overwatch is much more about what we hope the, the world would sort of be. And I promise the citizens of Mexico when we make the Italy map, we will only use reference of Mexico for that. Um, so Chris Metzen, who is our creative director, uh, he's since retired and I miss him dearly. I hope he comes back to us. Um, has a quote that I just love, which is that Blizzard is a hero factory. And he sort of means two things by this. One, um, we, if, if we had to align ourselves in terms of the type of heroes we create, they're lawful good paladins. Um, if you look at Uther, if you look at Thrall, if you look at Raynor, they're all kind of, they, they fit a type. But also that we try to make our players walk away from our games feeling like the hero. And Overwatch, more than the, than the um, the environments that we built, Overwatch is more about the heroes than anything else. Um, and I think it's interesting to talk about how heroes are a part of the world building process. It's not just about these environments that you're building. So approachability is one of the top things we care about. We want as many people to feel included and welcomed in Overwatch as possible. So for that reason, each of the heroes has to have extremely distinct gameplay mechanics and also extremely varying skill levels required to be good at those heroes. We want some heroes to be very approachable, very easy for players to pick up and play, and other heroes have an extremely high skill cap because we care very much about hardcore skilled players as well. So there's a great variety there. The other sort of obvious thing is the visual design. It starts with the character silhouette and how the character gets modeled, but also includes how the character gets animated and posed. We wanted you know, characters to be very visually different um, and you could recognize them from anywhere on the battlefield. But even more than sort of the gameplay and art mechanics behind how these heroes work, we wanted there to be heroes that felt approachable to each person. We all like different things. We're all attracted to different things. That's one of the beautiful things about humanity and making a game on planet Earth is how awesome the differences are. Um, so we started getting into the backstories of all these heroes, and we found it to be really, really fun to sort of explore different countries and how different people from different countries might think about one another um, and, and how they're all gonna interact. And it became really fun. And what's weird to us is that Overwatch started to spark lots of discussions about diversity. Um, it was a very hot topic during the development of Overwatch. I think it's still a very important topic um, in, in today's gaming world. And so there was a lot of discussion about diversity. And um, we've been both praised and criticized um, for some of our decisions when it comes to diversity. And I think it's really interesting that people think that diversity was the goal of the Overwatch team when it was not. Um, what we cared about was creating a game and a game universe and a world where everybody felt welcome. And really what the goal was, was inclusivity and open-mindedness. We wanted there to be um, this feeling, and, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, and I think they've agreed with it, that um, you know, when I say like you, you might be from somewhere that we haven't represented yet in Overwatch, um, but you could imagine there being an Overwatch hero or an Overwatch map from your area, um, and it seems totally plausible. Like, it seems like at any time I could be represented in the game. It's this sort of open-mindedness and inclusivity that were the goal of Overwatch. I think diversity is a beautiful 
end result that you get when you embrace inclusivity and open-mindedness. Now, we, the, the subject of stereotypes comes up um, frequently. If you are making, we found it like super challenging to make a game on planet Earth. Azeroth and Sanctuary and the StarCraft universe are far safer, but as soon as you say somebody's from a location, like I probably pissed somebody off from Hollywood today, <laughs> but um, as soon as you say somebody's from a location, um, everybody gets very sensitive. Um, so we've tried to, in many ways, challenge a lot of stereotypes. So I'm not gonna tell the story of each of the heroes that I've put up on the screen behind me, but in some way, each of them challenges a stereotype. Anna on the far left is particularly interesting to me because she is a sniper, she is an older woman who is a mother and has a very complicated uh, story with her daughter about whether or not she did the right thing by the way of her daughter. So as you can see, there's not a lot of games you know, featuring older Egyptian mothers who happen to be snipers. Um, we went out of our way to sort of challenge this notion. Um, in December, we wanted to kind of put a thank you out to our community, so we made a comic book uh, written by Michael Chu, our lead writer, that was called Reflections. And we wanted it um, to feature all of our heroes in their home life. We show them you know, in these uh, adventurous movies all the time and doing all these cool things in the game, and we want to show them in their home life. And Reflections um, happened to reveal that Tracer had a girlfriend at home, not a boyfriend, like some people expected. And this is all part of what we on the Overwatch team just think of as normal things are normal. And it's important to show normal things as normal so they become more normal. And um, a lot of people had expected other characters to maybe be representative of the L LGBT community and maybe it wasn't Tracer. And to us, what was important about Tracer was that she was this badass time traveling hero first and foremost. Um, I, I was preparing for this talk and I, I took a moment to study some of the shooters over the past 10 years. And as I was looking into these games, and these are some of my favorite games of all time, I play more shooters, I dare say, than anybody and I, I've poured more hours into these games um, than uh, I'd like anybody to really be aware of. <laughs> Um, and I've had so much fun, but I started to notice a trend like as I put the box covers together of these games, and the trend seems to be grizzled soldier dude. Um, and it made me think about um, just how different Overwatch was in so many ways that, you know, when I look back on the past 10 years of great shooters, um, and I'm not trying to say that Overwatch is a great shooter, but um, we aspire to be, um, it's very different to have an LGBT character on the cover and also one who's a female. Um, so it's something that we're pretty proud of. Now, don't think for a second that we don't also embrace stereotypes. So um, I've never had an American come up to me and complain about the horrible representation of Americans in video games. It's actually, um, it's more sad that I think a lot of us Americans see ourselves like this guy back here when it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, really what was happening through this whole process is that the world that we were building and the heroes that we were creating no longer belonged to us. So the fans of Overwatch, through fan fiction, through cosplay, through the most amazing fan art that I've ever seen, started to take over the world building and the intellectual property uh, for us. You can ask the Overwatch fans who's dating who in the Overwatch lineup, and it's actually kind of amazing. They have stories for, for all of the heroes and, and what their love lives are, um, and we love it. We think it's the, it's the best thing ever, that it belongs to them. We now think of ourselves, you know, Blizzard and the Overwatch team, we are just the custodians of the universe. We're taking care of it for what our community is gonna create moving forward. Um, and at the end of January, we saw something very special happen. There was an international uh, march for women's rights that, that took place all over the world. And the thing that really caught our eye was that in Seoul, Korea, um, during the march, somebody was flying this flag that had the symbol for Diva, who is our, our character from Korea, who in some way challenges stereotypes and, uh, and in other ways embraces them. Um, but we saw this flag flying for Diva um, and we looked into it more, and there was this, um, nas this national foundation 
uh, for Diva, which was a feminist foundation for women's rights. And what really started to fascinate me when I looked more into this, I started to read their charter, and I don't expect you guys to be able to read any of this, um, but it's the last sentence there. So we decided to act for feminism under her emblem, they're talking about Diva, so that in 2060, someone like Diva, Diva could actually um, exist, which I thought was just amazing. And it sort of came back to um, that original point that I was trying to make of never accept the world for as it appears to be, but dare to see it for what it could be. And that was exactly what was happening in, in Korea. In no way do we aspire to be a political game. We have no political motivations whatsoever. Um, but it's fascinating to see that the values of the Overwatch team are now being embraced and owned by the community um, in their own sort of positive way. And I, I wanted to end with my team because um, this is my team today, and it's obviously bigger than the 40 people that we started with. Um, and a lot of that is because um, we've had a decent launch, um, and luckily we didn't get dispersed to, to the winds. Um, we still exist. But I talk a lot about Overwatch and um, sort of the people that it's touched and the type of world that we tried to build. Um, but I want to remind people that, and I hate to use the word because it sounds negative, but we started building Overwatch from almost a selfish place. And what I mean by that is you had a team that was faced with little hope and a lot of despair, and we felt like there was um, failure. It was kind of a dark situation that we were in. And to almost pull ourselves out of that dark situation, we imagined a bright and hopeful world. Um, and it all became true. It was sort of a fairy tale ending. I don't want for a second to discount the importance of realism in video games. I think it's extremely important for us as an industry to keep pursuing realism because we need to show people what the world is like. Likewise, I hope there continues to be an awesome pursuit of post-apocalyptic games because it's very important for us to imagine what could end up being our future if we're not careful. But I hope in some ways that the Overwatch experience of the Overwatch team uh, stands to show that there is room for positivity and inclusiveness in our industry as well. Thank you guys very much. I hope you enjoy the summit.